Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. Hey, David Thomas. Hey, Sissy Goff. So fun to be back. It is. Except this isn't going to be a very fun episode. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but important and hopefully informative. Yeah, ooh, that's good. Important and informative. That's true. We wanted to talk today about the three things we're seeing the most in our counseling offices with girls and boys, and those are anxiety, depression, and anger. And my guess is you're seeing some of one of the three at least in your house, too. And so we want to talk a little bit about what to watch for and even more so how and where to get help. because. It just feels more important than ever, I think we would both say, in light of where we are with our world. So, okay, let's start with anxiety, because that's definitely what we're seeing the most. And you all probably know this, but anxiety is definitely the number one mental health problem in the world, not only among kids, but also among grownups. The great news is it's also the most treatable. So there are a lot of things that we can do to help, that you can do at home to help, but especially in counseling, I think we see movement pretty quickly when it comes to anxiety, which is awesome. And y'all likely know this, but I have written three books on anxiety in the last year and a half and I'm about to start my next. And I did a lot of research. I think at this point I have read, I don't know, 35 books on anxiety. I've become a certified anxiety specialist twice over. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. It's really fun. Not really, but in all of that research, the definition of anxiety I came up with, that's a very much a layman's term, is that anxiety is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of themselves. And we are seeing it so much with kids. And it often looks very different in girls and in boys. And so I want to talk about really what it can look like in each. David's going to jump in about what it looks like in boys. But With girls, I feel like most girls who are anxious lean towards one side of a continuum that I would say on one end are the exploders and on the other end are the imploders. And the exploders, when I sit with those parents, they're using words like demanding, manipulative, angry, controlling, and especially for younger girls, I cannot tell you how often I sit with parents. They feel like they're at the end of their rope with their kids, and it feels like their kids are just being difficult. And the more we talk about it, you know, one of my first questions is always, tell me when it's coming up. What are the trends or the themes you're seeing in it? And it's so often is when those kids have to make a transition quickly, when there's unpredictability, and when they feel out of control. And In the absence of kids having healthy coping strategies, control becomes their primary coping strategy. It does for us, too. I can lean that way every so often. I don't know about you, David. Me, too. Maybe in our oneness, we get that way, especially. But I think with those kids, we want to be really aware of if there are anger outbursts, if they're becoming really controlling, really rigid, really frustrated with us, if all of a sudden we change the schedule at the last minute. You know, when are the patterns? What are the patterns? Because that's often what's at the core of what's going on with them. And I think the more we can look underneath the behavior and be aware of that, the more compassion we have towards kids, rather than just the frustration of the behavior. Back to our friend, Tina Bryson who was on that talked about all behaviors communication. So that's one end. Those are the exploders. The imploders are more of the kids who are perfectionistic, and they are the kids who have pretty constant tummy aches, headaches, complain about more physical issues. They are putting a whole lot of pressure on themselves. And so they're the kids who really maintain very well during the school day. And y'all know, if I'm talking about your daughter particularly, you go to parent-teacher conferences and they say she is delightful 
I wish every child in my class acted like your daughter. And you're thinking, well, that's not who I pick up from school. But it's interesting because I think that lends itself to another one of the statistics that is girls are dealing with anxiety twice as much as boys, but they're taken in for therapy less. And I think it's so often because at the root of this perfectionism and pressure that so many girls feel, there's anxiety, but it makes them fly below the radar and want to please and want to do the right thing. And so those kids, we often miss what's going on with them. And in fact, we don't only miss it, but that behavior gets reinforced. And so we want to be aware if they're leaning towards more exploding or imploding and how we can lean in and help. So that would be one of the ways to identify it with girls. Another would be what I would call loops and questions. And y'all may have heard me say this before, but I feel like with kids who are anxious, they have these thoughts that are like the one loop roller coaster at the fair. You know, we all have thousands of intrusive thoughts every day about all manner of things. Realistically, 80% of our thoughts are negative and 95% of those thoughts are on repeat. And so these kids are having these negative intrusive thoughts that just circle around and around and around and they can't get whatever it is out of their head. You know, what the schedule's supposed to be like, if you're going to be okay when you're away from them, their stomach hurts it a little bit, and maybe it's about throwing up, maybe it's about the pandemic. I mean, it could be anything that they're looping on, and it's often the worst thing they can imagine happening developmentally. And so those kids, we often can recognize it by endless questions. That's just indicative of that loop. So, I mean, I saw that so much this summer. We haven't even really talked, David, about what I saw at Hopetown this summer at our little version of a summer retreat program. But I have never had as many questions Mm. from girls in particular as I did this summer with particularly the younger ones, second through fourth and fifth and sixth. I mean, they just were endless. I mean, there was one girl that I remember pulling aside and she had tears in her eyes. And I think she was literally asking me about the schedule for the 25th time in an hour. And I just said, this is not helping you. For me to answer another question doesn't help you. It's just feeding more questions. And that's what happens. And the research says we should never answer more than five questions about the same topic. Because you know, if your kids do that, they never say, oh, that's the answer I was looking for. Never mind, I'm fine. They just keep looping over and over and over. And then the third way I would say we really recognize it in girls, and it's part of what we're talking about with the imploders. But I mean, every girl I've ever seen, and David, I would be curious what you'd say about this with boys, but every girl I've ever seen who deals with anxiety is really bright, often off the charts bright. They're really conscientious. They try hard. They care deeply. They're really the coolest kinds of kids. And it's like they just don't know how to turn the volume down. And so we just want to pay attention to all of those things and how significant is the anxiety impeding their function. And that's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes as far as when and how to get help. What about boys? What do you see the most with boys? I think the presentation often, not always, but often is different. I think anxious boys look more angry than they look worried or fearful. I've had countless parents over the years even say to me in my office, like, he's not anxious. He's explosive. You know, he's not worried. He's angry. And that's where we have to look underneath because as we'll discuss in a few minutes with depression, it just so often in its presentation looks different with boys. And so even thinking about you talking about the imploders and exploders, I would argue I have seen more boys over the years who are anxious, who are classic exploders. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a percentage of boys, I'd even argue more firstborn boys who are more perfectionistic and pleasing. But generally speaking, they're going to be more eruptive. And I think it fits with, you know, the statistics would tell us that 80 to 90% of behavioral problems in schools are boys. And Mm -hmm. so those classic exploders are struggling in those ways, which I would even wonder if that doesn't lead to some of what you said about where girls are diagnosed more, but boys are taken for counseling more often because it's presenting in ways that have become significantly problematic as opposed to they're more perfectionistic and pleasing. I would say, secondly, that it can mirror ADHD. It can look identical. And I've seen a number of boys over the years who were misdiagnosed with attention deficit disorder who actually had anxiety. And so I talk a lot about, you know, I think for boys and girls that anxiety just takes up a lot of mental real estate. And if I am devoting a lot of my cognitive energy to 
things I worry about, things I fear, things I'm overthinking, then I think those boys in a classroom setting look underfocused. They look fidgety. They look restless. They look dysregulated. And so it's that classic presentation that would make us want to point our finger toward the possibility of some attention deficit, but is oftentimes an underlying anxiety that's really important to pay attention to. And then I would say, lastly, in terms of the presentation, you spoke so well to this, the repetitive questions and the becoming more controlling piece. I see a lot of that in terms of how it shows up with boys. And I talk with parents a lot about how I think there's always a power and control phenomena with anxiety, as you were saying, that, you know, to the degree that any one of us feels out of control internally, we're going to try to control something externally, people, circumstances, outcome situations, and the more controlling a boy's getting is always a cue for me to the possibility that that is there, which I would say to the books you mentioned, I've said before, and I want to say again, any parent listening of a boy who's struggling with some excessive worry or anxiety, I could not recommend Sissy's book enough. And though she was Writing with girls in mind, the strategies and the practices within that book are the exact things we're doing with boys here at Daystar. And so I think it's an invaluable resource and would strongly recommend you grab hold of that. We are so thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Minnow to bring back the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. We all know that devices are here to stay. So if you want to make screen time meaningful for your kids, Minnow is for you. A new streaming service designed just for kids. Minnow has over 2,000 episodes of fun and faith-filled shows that have been carefully curated by moms, dads, and church leaders, so it's safe for your family. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com dot go m i n n o dot com to start your free trial. Okay, let's talk about depression. And I think we both have felt concerned in the last year and a half and really probably both seen this anxiety skyrocketing and then the longer the anxiety has hung around for kids, it feels like it's bleeding into much more depression. Yes. And statistically Pre-pandemic, we were at 8.5% of children and adolescents were depressed. Now we're one in four. And so we're definitely seeing evidence of it across the board. It really was so interesting to this summer, not just spend an hour a week with different kids, but to live with kids at Hopetown. And I saw it in spades. I mean, the anxiety, and it was fascinating because it was definitely more anxiety among the younger ones. And we got particularly to seventh and eighth grade camp. And I mean, David, you would have been blown away. They were absent, Mm. these kids. And what's hard about depression, and we probably need to back up for a second and say, (laughs) when your kids become adolescents, if we were to pull out the DSM, which is the diagnostic manual, we don't diagnose kids at Daystar, but if we did, that's what we would use. And if we were to read to you either what it looks like from a diagnostic standpoint to have depression or even bipolar depression, it looks a lot like adolescence just in general because their hormones are raging. I mean, there's so much happening inside of them that there's going to be a shift in them. And we're going to talk about specifically when to pay attention to it. But it was way more significant than I've ever seen. I mean, kids who have had so much life and been so engaging and the first to have their hands up, the first to respond to a peer who's struggling, just were silent. And so I would say in girls, one of the first things that I'm noticing right now is just withdrawal, that they just pull back. They pull back inside of themselves. You talk about that family that talked about, tell your face that you're feeling a certain way. That's how I felt all summer. Tell your face that you're enjoying this. Tell your face that you're even present. A girl said that to me years ago, I hide behind my face. And that's what it felt like they were hiding. And so being really aware of withdrawal with girls, pulling away, especially they're going to pull away from you some, that's normal developmentally. But when you're seeing them pull away from their peers and from activities they love, that's when we start to become really concerned about kids. And I think girls in particular, because so many of them, they seem kind of flat around you, but they come to life around their friends. So withdrawal would be the first. The second would be, I think, for girls, either that really flat affect, so their little faces are blank, 
or irritability. I feel like the way parents describe it often in my office is they'll say, you know, my daughter has lost her joy. And that's, again, adolescents, they do a little, but you'll see that joy pick right back up with their friends. And so if it's not, if you feel like that joy is gone in all aspects, all areas of her life, we want to be really attentive to that. And it also can look like low energy and fatigue in the same way. And then third, I would say, if your daughter is exhibiting pervasive feelings of sadness or hopelessness, you know, I think about Proverbs 13, 12, about hope deferred makes the heart sick. We are living in a year and a half of hope deferred, all of us. And so, of course, they're feeling this way. So if you feel like that's going on with your child And especially if there's any talk of self-harm or suicide at this point, and you're going to talk more about this, but I think at this point, you definitely want to take them to get help as soon as you possibly can. I don't know if you have felt that way, David, but I think I'm just taking everything that even sounds like depression more seriously than I ever have in this day and time. Yes. What would you say about boys? What do you think it looks like? I would say with depression, again, the presentation is going to look different. You know, when we even think about depression, we often think of sad, withdrawn, lethargic, and certainly boys could present in those more classic ways. But generally speaking, they often look more irritable and disgruntled. It's like a low-grade discontentment. That's often what I will see with boys. And so watch for all those possibilities that could trip us up because it's not the classic presentation as we understand it first. Second, I would say it mirrors development. You know, I think boys can many times be hard to reach on a good day under the best of circumstances. They don't necessarily as instinctively talk about their internal experience. And so it can be even harder to track that with boys, particularly as they move into pre and mid adolescence, because just out of who they are and how they're wired, they're going to be a little less likely to share their experience. And so I think it can understandably in that space developmentally scare parents even more. And we'll talk about what to do with that in a few minutes. But one thing I would say within it is that what I call inward movement that is instinctive with boys, they have to learn and practice what I call healthy outward movement that is not as instinctive. And that's not saying he has to all of a sudden be great and enjoy and love sitting around the dinner table and talking at length about his day. (laughs) But it is to say learning enough healthy outward movement so that he doesn't turn inward on himself in ways that, again, I think are instinctive oftentimes for boys and can become more of a breeding ground for depression. The last category would be something you spoke well to, and I see a lot of it with boys. It's just losing interest in things he once enjoyed. You know, a sport he loved to play, all of a sudden he has no desire to play at all. That is a red flag. And I want to say, I want to point out, that's different than him saying, I don't want to do this anymore and I want to try something different. I'm not concerned about that. A boy who's like, I'm kind of done with lacrosse and I want to try this. As long as there's something else he's wanting to chase, that's different than just, I don't want to play that and I don't want to play anything else except video games. (laughs) You know, even depressed boys seem to always want to play that. And there again, I am supportive of boys having some screen time with healthy limits, but not using video games as an escape or a coping strategy because it's not. So you want to talk about some anger now? Should we? Yes, you've already talked about it a lot, which I think is so reflective. As you're talking about it, I think that is not where girls go naturally. And so to me, if there is a lot of anger, it is always a signal that there's more to the story. And I think for younger girls, it's interesting. I think I've had this conversation in the last two weeks, probably five times with parents, that I think girls are more perfectionistic than they've ever been. And for younger girls who can lean that way, they will often get angry at you, and you'll get more of the brunt of that. And this is going to sound a little crazy. Just hang in there with me for a minute. I don't know if any of you are perfectionists out there, but you know, often parents will say to me, I never would have said those things to my parents. I would have never felt that free to get angry with my parents. And what I think happens often for girls is when they're younger, the anger that is fueled by anxiety is directed outward. And there is an age that it shifts to inward. And so if your daughter is becoming angry with you, it is actually fantastic. Because I wish, as a perfectionist, I had directed some of mine outward younger because I think my parents could help me work through it. 
And so if you're getting some of it, you have an opportunity to help her learn to manage it and deal with it in a way that you won't once it turns inward. And so we want to be aware for girls if it's directed outward, again, that there's more to it, that there's a deeper reason because girls do want to please. And so if something's significant enough that it's pushing them past wanting to please and letting that anger out, then something really is going on for her. And so That's one thing I want to think about is for younger ones that it's going to be directed outward. And secondly, I would say girls are just so hard on themselves. We want to help them learn how to process that part of things, of being hard on themselves. And often they will have anger outbursts that are about something stupid. I mean, I remember a girl telling me that I feel like there was just this 10-minute tirade that she had on her mom about everything imaginable. I mean, her hair, her mom didn't fix her hair, right? all these different things. And at the end was when she finally got to the truth of she didn't like herself very much at that point. And so I think we want to, if your daughter is really angry, not in the moment, because we like we talk about so often when kids are operating out of their amygdala, which they are when they're angry, we want to give them a space to go to all the things y'all have heard us say a million times, but then to circle back around and see if they can get to what's going on at a deeper level. Because again, there's more to it if it's coming out in that way. And then the third thing I would say is as you're looking at things that can be deeper, I mean, if they have a really short fuse, which Some girls are going to have a shorter fuse. And like David talked about, anxiety and ADHD symptomatically are almost identical. But often girls with ADHD get angrier quicker than girls who don't have ADHD. And so it's part of that whole look underneath the behavior because they have a shorter fuse. One to 10 scale, they're going to go to 10 faster. They have a harder time, what we would call putting the brakes on. Basically, all of that to say girls are so relationally wired that if they are allowing anger to come in between your relationship with them or especially their relationship with their peers, when girls are having anger outbursts with other kids, that's when I think it's probably time to take them to see somebody because there's more to the story. And we want to help them get underneath that initial behavior because they're not going to be able to on their own. Yeah, I think that is such a great point of where that would be a cue for you with girls that there's something more going on. And anger is so familiar and common with boys, as I've been saying with anxiety and depression, that it just might mean it's Tuesday. It's just a, <laughs> it's just a normal day. Well, I should have said it could mean that girls are about to start their periods if they're older, because that True would make that. a Tuesday make sense, too. Well, and even thinking about the developmental timeline, it's important to note that somewhere around 9 to 10 Boys will begin to channel all primary emotions, fear, sadness, disappointment, confusion, into anger. That is an instinctive process. And I think culturally we support that. You know, I think we give males in our world a lot of permission to be angry, not a lot of space to be sad. And so I think that biological process is going on 9 to 10. And then I think boys are just absorbing these cultural messages that further that whole process. So It's where I would say next, we're going to have to do a lot of what I call looking under the hood. You know, that piece you spoke well to of anger is a secondary emotion. There's always something underneath. And I would say, lastly, within that, go back and listen to our Are My Kids on Track season, in particular when we talk about vocabulary and resourcefulness, those two episodes. I don't think we can lean in far enough with kids in general, boys, I would argue in particular because it's so difficult for them to identify exactly what it is that they're feeling and can just cover over so much of that with the anger piece. So I'd really labor long and hard with those two milestones in particular with boys when it comes to anger. What about when to look for a counselor? What would you say? We thought it could be really helpful for our intentional practices today that we just spend some time talking about when to seek help and how to find a counselor, that that feels so important as we're discussing these things that we're seeing so much of. And I would say a first rule of thumb is look for patterns, whether it's anxiety, depression, anger, look for patterns. Is this more of a one-time struggle, an episode, or is this something that's becoming chronic and consistent? And that's really key is, you know, asking questions like, is it just problematic? Is this troublesome? Or is it debilitating? Is it getting in the way of daily functioning? So for example, with anxiety, a lot of kids develop what we call school avoidance. It's one thing if they just get a little teary and are 
fearful on the drive to school and walking in the building. It's another if they can't get in the building. If it's becoming debilitating, if it's becoming chronic and consistent, that's when we want to think about reaching out for help. Second would be going back to what we said about assess interests. Have they lost interest in friendships, activities where they were once really engaged, and we can't connect that to a specific circumstance. Kind of like I said, I'm kind of done with lacrosse, and I want to go on to a different sport. So watching for evidence of that, particularly with peers and adolescents, because I think that is such a significant developmental need of engagement with same-age peers. And so if they don't have interest in that space, that's worth leaning into. And with all that, I would lastly say, when in doubt— When in doubt, if you find that you are circling around some of the same questions or concerns, I want you to consider doing a consultation. Do that with your pediatrician. Reach out to a trusted source. We've talked before about how that's a huge part of what we do here at Daystar with parents in other cities, states, and even other countries. We've done it with parents across the globe and do that by phone or through Zoom where we can just sit down and talk about what you're observing, what you're seeing, and if those things seem to be moving beyond problematic into some really concerning space. So just to put another set of eyes on it, I think is a great rule of thumb that could give you as parents peace of mind and we can help define kind of a roadmap for moving forward. I love this. How about finding a counselor if you're in another city? Well, let me just preface that to say we wish we knew. I wish we had a database of every fabulous counselor in every city, and we don't, and we can't. But there are a lot of really great ones out there. And so a few things we would recommend if you're wondering, how do I find the right counselor for my child? So the first thing we would say is to ask your pediatrician, your school, or your church. And really, you could call all three, because then if you hear a name more than once, you know that's a name to go ahead and check out. So those are three great places that will know resources, and often will have vetted them. Like, we don't refer out of Dacer until we've not only met the person, but we have had families that go to see them. And a lot of schools and churches and pediatricians' offices are going to do exactly the same. So that would be first. Second would be to ask some trusted friends that you can share some of what's going on. And same thing, if you hear the same name come up, then that would be someone worth pursuing. The third thing we would highly recommend is to go interview the counselor yourself. Get a feel for their office, what the space is like. If you can picture your child or teenager there, get a feel for them, what they're like. And then that gives you an opportunity to ask some questions. And probably the questions we would recommend, you can write these down and take them with you when you go. First, what kind of training do they have working specifically with kids? And I don't know if you've had this happen very often, but I will sometimes sit with parents for an assessment and they will say, well, we saw somebody else first, but it was actually my counselor and they didn't work a lot with kids. And number one, it's not helpful for it to be your counselor because your child's not going to feel safe telling your counselor things about you, which in a healthy way, that's going to happen from time to time. You want them to have a place to process. And so it needs to be somebody separate, but it specifically needs to be somebody well-versed in the language of kids that feels relatable. And so what kind of training do they have working with kids first? Second, what kind of involvement do you have as a parent? At Daystar, our process is every third session, we meet with the parent half the time. Now, we obviously are still respecting the child's confidentiality, and we don't tell the parent exactly what the child says. But it is so important for you to be a part of the process because often the things that they're working on in counseling, you can reinforce at home. And so it's very much important for you to have a role in the counseling process with the counselor. And so ask them what that looks like and what kind of role you can have. Third, we really want you to pay attention to your gut when you're with that person. I think hands down, Dave and I would both say the two things that matter most in looking for a counselor are warmth and the ability to connect with your child. The best counselors out there are really warm and can say hard things when needed. You need them to be able to do that. We talk so often about Sitting with kids, we're not saying anything new. We're just a new voice. And so sometimes they hear us louder. And so they need to be able to say things that are encouraging and they need to help your child move forward. And sometimes that takes a little more prodding. So warmth, connectability, and the ability to say hard things too. And then 
the bottom line, we would say, lastly, is you do really, really want to trust your gut. You know your kids better than anybody else, and you know who's going to be a good fit. And so we sure want you to go with that and trust your gut in it. And now Melissa is going to anchor us to some timeless truths. Feelings. Oh, go to the Psalms, where the psalmist, the singers will struggle. They will talk. They will sing. They will fall flat on their face, and they will rise up again with their hands and their heads toward God. I love in Psalm 3.3, when David is running from his son Absalom, he says, God, you're a shield around me. But then he says, you are the one who lifts my head. I love that image because so often that's what happens to us. Literally, our heads go down, our eyes go down, downcast because we're overwhelmed in our feelings. And we don't even know how to name them. We don't really know what's going on. It's some vague sense. But the promise, the truth here, and what David is experiencing In the midst of being so fearful, so discouraged, he says, God, you are the one who lifts my head. You lift my eyes up. And all summer long in seeing so many kids experience and begin to identify those feelings, the question comes, now what? Okay, so I'm anxious. Yes, I am angry. I'm discouraged. I don't want to go back. I do want to go back, and I can't. There is so much that they are experiencing, so many feelings that are there. I have one message today about feelings, and it's one that I saw with the kids and one that I recently read in a book, a new book by Katie Hasselton called All the Things. I really recommend it. I love it. But she says, to quote her, your goal isn't to pray a feeling away but to pray with that feeling. And I think our tendency with our kids and the kids' tendency is, how do I deny this feeling? How do I make it go away? We spend more time and energy trying to get rid of the feeling. When as we read in the Psalms and we identify with the psalmist to pray with the feeling, God, I am jealous today, and my eyes are on this one certain person. Oh, you know their name already, and I'm so jealous, and it makes me feel just sick inside. God, help me. So often, our prayers are, I'm so sorry, I'm jealous, or it may be, I just don't want to pray today, and we keep our distance from him. It is to pray with the feeling, to pray through the feeling, to know that He is a God who walks alongside us, that He wants to lift our eyes, to lift our heads to Him. But we don't have to try to make the feeling go away before we can pray, before we can come into His presence. Let's go to Him and let Him do the good work that he started in us. I've been cleaning and straightening and organizing Hopetown, our lake house, where we have our camp in the summer. And I was trying to organize my books. I have a lot of books because I love books. And I thought, you know, I need to give some of these away. So out of about 500, I found about five I could share with someone else. As I was going through, and the reason is that every book had a message for me or stirred a memory in me of who gave me that book. But there were about five or six books that I could trace that took me back in my life and how God used those books. One of them is an old book by Catherine Marshall called Beyond Ourselves. And I opened it up, and in the front of it it said it was 1966. I remember the chapter that meant so much to me. As I was talking to a couple of Bible studies that I was leading this week, I was telling them about this and finding books, even showed them that book. And you know, it wasn't so much the book that they needed to read as 
what I was sharing is God is so faithful that when I was 16 years old, that this book, that God taught me more about prayer in a chapter called The Prayer of Relinquishment and how God is so faithful. And I think that that's what I'm wanting to say to you all as parents right now. The feelings will be up and down. There will be so many feelings, and the anxiety is so strong right now with kids and anger. But he is faithful. Philippians 1.6 says that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus, that he has begun a good work in you. I love that. And I was sharing that in my Bible studies this week to say, since 1966, even as I fell flat on my face, God is faithful. And then 2 Timothy 1, 12, it says, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know whom I have believed. And I think that as I found that book that was dated back to 1966, when I believed that God had a purpose for my life, and I believed that He would be faithful, that I was reminded that years later, when I'm talking to these Bible study groups, that He began a good work, that He started this work. He started a work in your child, and they will be anxious and they will fall flat on their face, as you will as a parent. But it's him. He began a good work. And you can learn, and your child can learn to pray with those feelings that are so disruptive and that we want to overcome and do away with. You can pray with them and don't take so much time to try to get rid of those feelings, but to let God use them. Oh, he's begun a good work in your child. He will carry on. I know whom I have believed. And he's able to keep what you have committed unto him against this day. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.